All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us in this webinar sponsored by the ASQ Innovation Division. Tonight, our presenter, Nicole Raswill, is going to talk about the in introduction of cybersecurity for quality professionals. Let me read about the description of this event. So, when you think of cybersecurity, you probably imagine hackers breaking into a corporate website to steal credit card numbers and other personal information. And unless you are an information technology professional, specifically working in network security, you may think there's not much you can do to help. But this is only a limited view of cybersecurity. Since about 2010, information now has the potential to damage or destroy physical assets, and these can have significant impact for production systems and supply chain resilience. This webinar will introduce you to cybersecurity and its relationship to quality systems and explain tools like the NIST Cybersecurity Framework and the Bullrich Cybersecurity Excellence Builder that you can start using now. Our presenter, Nicole Ratiwil, is an Associate Professor of Production Systems in the Department of Integrated Science and Technology at James Madison University in Harrisburg, Virginia. She is a Fellow of the American Society for Quality and is a certified Six Sigma Black Belt and Certified Manager of Quality and Organizational Excellence. She has a PhD in Quality Systems from Indiana State University, and her research focuses on the intersection of quality, innovation, and neurodiversity in cognitive production systems. She is one of ASQ New Voices of Quality and participates in ASQ Influential Voices with her blog at qualityandinnovation.com. So we are very pleased to have Nicole Randy Will um, as a presenter tonight. So she's going to deliver the presentation, and if we have some time um, after that, uh, we're going to open it for Q&A. Uh, participants are more welcome to use the chat feature and uh, send it to the presenter. So and um, again, like if we have enough time, um, Nicole will be more than glad to to answer the question. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole. Nicole, please take it off. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, as Jose mentioned, my name is Nicole, and I teach at JMU in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And today we're going to talk about cybersecurity. So hopefully those of you who are on this webinar right now, you know a lot about quality, but a little bit about cybersecurity, and you're trying to, to uh, increase your knowledge in that domain. Or maybe you know a lot about the, the technical aspects of cybersecurity, but you're interested to see how it relates to what we do as quality professionals. So hopefully I'll answer both of those questions for you and any other questions that you have by the end of the hour. Um, you can see on the front slide here, um, I have my email address for you. I also have my Twitter handle. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will be dropping a link to the presentation slides on uh, my Twitter account. So you, you should uh, be able to access that even if you don't have a Twitter account just by knowing my Twitter ID, which is just my first name. And my so a little bit more about me. I started out as a meteorologist, but then in the late 1990s, I became a management consultant, and I worked in the telecom industry. And what I did for my clients was I helped them with IT, OT integration. You probably know what information technology is, but you're going to learn a lot about operations technology in this presentation and how it relates to IT. Um, so I started, I started working at that interface back in the late 90s. In 2002, I moved to the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in West Virginia, uh, where I helped them manage, monitor, and control systems, and also data analysis software development for very, very large telescopes. So uh, if you've ever seen the movie Contact, the telescope that Jodie Foster was working on, uh, that was one of our telescopes. Um, but the one I spent most of my time on uh, is in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. You see now our telescope was really, really big, the world's largest steerable angle dish telescope. Um, so big that it was bigger than the Statue of Liberty, and just almost as big as the Washington Monument. And I say was, but it's still actually there up by Snowshoe Mountain in West Virginia. The other things that I wanted to mention is that uh, I'm also the editor of the, the SQP journal for ASQ and the Innovation Division newsletter. So I strongly encourage 
any of you uh, who have either news and announcements that would be of interest to the people in the innovation division, or if you have short or long articles that are software related, I would love to hear from you about that. So I had to do a little bit of plug there to make sure the word gets out. So, as Jose mentioned, usually, and I did this at the, the Wiki conference in, in Charlotte this year, I went around to people and I said, what do you think about cybersecurity? What, what do you know about it? And most of the time I get answers like, oh, well, you know, that's the stuff you have to do in your organization to make sure that, that, that your databases are secure. Make sure that, you know, you don't give away your customers' social security numbers or credit card numbers. Um, when I ask them, is it your responsibility? The, the people in our, in our profession um, would say things like, well, sure, but, you know, usually it's, it's other people who do that. Usually it's something that the guys over on the network side do. You don't really have to worry about it. You should think about it. It should be important to you. But really, it's their job. So what I would like to do in this presentation is share with you how cybersecurity is a, a much more broad thing and how it, it relates directly to both quality and innovation. <clears throat> so this is my favorite definition of quality. It comes from ISO 9001. And uh, ISO 9001 defines quality as the totality of characteristics of an entity that bear upon its ability to satisfy stated and implied needs. And there's two aspects to this. There's the product quality aspect, which means, you know, you, you know the, the objectives, the, the um, characteristics that your product needs to, to have to satisfy those needs. But then there's also production quality, which is, you know, are your systems, are your systems, um, are your processes and your system structured such that you can deliver um, the, your product to the level of quality in a consistent manner? So there's two aspects of being able to meet stated satis uh, to satisfy stated and applied needs. So one of the things we like to talk about in the innovation division is how closely related innovation is to quality. Uh, and the definition that I like to use is the same ISO 9001 definition, but you can think of innovation as the totality of characteristics of an entity that bear upon its ability to satisfy future data and unplied needs. Um, and this, this dovetails very nicely um, with Peter Merrill, our, our founding, um, founding chair, dovetails very nicely with his definition of innovation as quality for the tomorrow. So we're trying to satisfy needs. Those needs can be stated by our customers in the form of requirements, or they can just be implied, but we're trying to do it later. We're trying to do it tomorrow, next year, next month. <clears throat> so that's the relationship between quality and innovation um, that I like to use. So what I'm going to be demonstrating in this presentation is that the, the totality of characteristics of an entity, whether that entity is your product or your production process, that cybersecurity is one of those elements that at this point in time, you absolutely must consider in order to achieve quality. And, and if you're trying to envision producing something in the future, that cybersecurity is one of those elements that you must address uh, if you're going to, um, if, if quality is important to you. So there are six topics that we're gonna be talking about. Um, first, I'm gonna step you through the history of what we call cyber physical systems. And I'll describe for you what that means. I'm going to show you a couple of short three-minute videos um, to give you a sense of what cybersecurity risk is all about. Um, we're going to talk about industrial control systems, that's ICS, and the critical infrastructure sectors that they um, help support. We're going to talk about the different kinds of threats and attacks and risks that you might encounter uh, when you're talking about cybersecurity. And then finally, how to protect against them. So some quality systems that you can put in place that'll help you um, build your cybersecurity defense. Most importantly, at the end, um, it should become clear to you why quality professionals are in an excellent position to help with cybersecurity. So um, if you are in the position where you're looking for a job and you're trying to figure out what to do, and you're really, really good with quality systems, um, cybersecurity may be a direction that you can go. So you'll notice in the top right-hand corner, You'll see these little hearts on my slides. 
Um, this one has a question mark in it, but the other ones that you'll see will have numbers in it. And those will have the numbers one through six to tell you where in the presentation that we're at so you can, uh, you can keep track of our progress. So something that I think is really cool that I like to tell my students about is that um, production systems, you know, we, we study, we have a little sector on production systems that I manage, and we study um, how things have been produced. And even in the quality domain, um, usually when we look back through the history, we, we look back to, you know, the 1800s or the 1700s for, you know, when mass production started. But what is more easily lost um, is that mechanical production started much, much earlier than just the 17 or 1800s. Um, in fact, it goes back to ancient times, to the Romans and Greeks. And we do uh, today in our production systems, we implement digital computing systems, you know, our, our computers, our phones, our tablets. But 2,000 years ago, um, they implemented analog computing, and in some cases, really, really well. So uh, one example of, of ancient analog computing is this thing called a water clock. And people used to be very skilled at measuring the, uh, they, they'd keep water in a reservoir, and they would measure the dimension of the, the wheels and the dials. And by the flow of the water, you'd actually be able to keep time. So, for example, if you had a, a legal agreement, a, a legal, um, what do you call it, a legal session or someone was, was at a trial and the trial had to last one hour, you could set your water clock so that it would time that hour. So when the water ran out, you, you would know your hour was up. And these analog computing systems became very um, sophisticated, as you can imagine. Um, as, as a matter of fact, the phrase, don't muddy the water, comes from these ancient water clocks because uh, if, if there was mud in the water, it would give you more time. So for, for school exams, um, sometimes it's rumored that the students would uh, put some dirt in the water supply for the water clock, and by muddying the water, they would get more time in uh, the, the time that was called out. Um, so th that's one of the reasons why I'm fascinated with analog computing. Um, we saw analog computing also back in World War I and World War II. Um, if you wondered how missile systems were done then, they didn't have the, the precision computing systems that we have now where you can, you know, with your GPS, declare what coordinates you want your missile to land at, and then all the calculations are done and the, the uh, equipment for shooting your missile is set up in exactly the right way uh, so that it goes and, and hits your target. So what they used to do uh, was they would have analog computing systems to measure out how you would set that missile up so that it would fly with the right uh, velocity given the, the wind and the, how your boat was moving so that it would hit the target that you wanted. And in these analog computing systems for the Navy, um, they had lots of interconnecting groups of uh, gears. So you can see on the, on the right-hand side here, that's an example of an analog computer for um, the time of flight. So if you're trying to calculate how long it would take for your missile to hit its target, uh, you would set the, the uh, one of these gears would be the angle, you'd set the angle, uh, and another gear would be the distance to your target. And then by moving one gear, moving the other gear relative to the first gear, you'd have a third gear move that actually calculates for you what your time of flight is. So this is one small example of uh, the kinds of analog computing systems that they had. Uh, but both of these, you know, the, these types of systems were part of um, production automation for, you know, back 2,000 years. So if any of you have heard of Industry 4.0, what that reflects is the transition in our production systems um, from those, those uh, ancient mechanical systems like water clocks and the analog computing like the, the fire um, systems in the military in World War I and World War II um, through where we are now. And most of this presentation is going to be on where we are now, but I want to show you how we got there. Um, in the late 1700s, we had uh, automation driven by water power and steam power, and so that allowed lots of craftspeople to, uh, you know, they, they were doing things by hand. They couldn't do large volumes. Um, these first mechanical systems allowed them to automate those processes even more. With the addition of electrical energy uh, and the concept of mass production, 
in the late 1800s and early 1900s, you know, this is where we started to get Frederick Taylor's scientific management. Uh, this is when this is when um, automated assembly and, and, and production lines became uh, possible. Um, so, you know, that continued for a while, but then another thing really interesting happened in 1969, and that was the invention of the PLC, the Programmable Logic Controller. And the PLC is, is still a core element in most automated production systems. Uh, even though it was invented in 1969, it took maybe, I don't know, four or five years to, to catch on, but it, it caught on really, really quickly because you could automate small parts in the production system, and by 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 pooling a lot of these PLCs together, uh, you could end up uh, with with really sophisticated decision processes that no longer required uh, human intervention. So it was kind of like the, the first implementation of intelligent systems in production. Now, the fourth industrial revolution, Industry 4.0, is happening right now, and it's happening with the use of cyber-physical systems. Cyber-physical systems basically just mean uh, systems that have a cyber component with connected electronic component and a physical component, so, you know, something you can touch. Um, uh, your, your automated vehicle, uh, you know, if you have a self-driving car, that can be considered a cyber physical system because it's, you know, physical, you know, the car part about it, and it's also, uh, you know, has the cyber part, the connected part where it can communicate with other cars uh, so that it, it can drive itself and, and this object in its general area. So this slide just shows you a summary of those four industrial revolutions. And, you know, like you see down at the bottom here, there's a question mark on year. We know cyber physical systems exist right now. Uh, we know that they're becoming um, more integrated with our uh, with our computerized systems that were that were made possible by the in invention of the PLC back in 1969. But what we don't know is when it's really going to take off. Uh, so you know, this is sometime sometime in the next five to 15 years is when we're going to enter the age of cyber physical systems. And of course. When you enter the age of cyber physical systems, then you know so many components are connected that you do need to think about cybersecurity for not only the individual components but for the system as a whole. So the definition that I like the best of cyber physical systems is the one up here in the top right that they're smart systems that uh, are co-engineered interacting networks of physical and computational components. So like I said before, easy to remember. There's a cyber part, which is the connected electronic part and there's a physical part. So the diagram over on the left-hand side uh, shows you places right now where we already have cyber-physical systems. Uh, medical devices, a lot of medical devices are connected. Uh, even pacemakers can be connected where you can reset them by uh, going onto a computer and logging in. Um, sensors from sensor networks. I mean, you, you may have seen uh, the little bees the B drones that can fly around collecting data from their environment. All those are, although those are uh, in the research stage right now, they still do exist. Connected cars already exist. Um, there's pretty sophisticated research going on, uh, imagining the, the engineering systems inside connected cars uh, when there's, you know, lots and lots of self-driving cars on the road. And this is much closer than, uh, much closer than I thought it, it would be five or 10 years ago, um, already the city of Pittsburgh has self-driving cars uh, as Ubers and Singapore, um, they just went, all of their buses are now self-driving. So this is, this is much closer than uh, at least I had thought a couple of years ago. Um, in the bottom, on the bottom left-hand side of, of this slide, um, what you'll see is that the cyber physical systems are uh, a, a inter interconnected systems. So. You have your devices, your, your sensors, your individual sensors. Those devices are within systems, like a car. And then those systems, like the individual cars, are elements of systems of systems. So that would be like the, the uh, many cars on the road that need to communicate with each other in order to make, um, in order to make the self-driving car concept real. Um, humans are part of the loop pretty much all of those levels. And that's one of the most important things that you have to remember when you're dealing with cybersecurity, that humans are in the loop.
I'm going to show you two quick videos here. They're both three minutes long. Um, the first one it deals with the cybersecurity risk in industrial systems, and the second one gets a little more personal. So let's watch those, and then we'll talk about uh, what they mean. We are all heavily reliant on critical industrial infrastructure, power plants, water and transport networks, oil and gas industries, they Over the last few years, however, cybersecurity and critical infrastructure has failed to keep pace with the increasing number of highly sophisticated cyber threats. This has left critical infrastructural objects with their modern computers and networks highly vulnerable to cyber attacks and cyber weapons. In 2010, the Stuxnet world, an advanced persistent threat, put almost 20% of Iran's nuclear centrifuges out of action, and then even worse. It went out of control and hit hordes of companies all over the world, including Chevron, one of the American energy corporations. It's important to understand you don't have to be a target to be a victim. Take the aging Conficker virus that no one worries about, or a simple crypto lock that encrypts your data and asks for money to restore. Both can be extremely harmful in an industrial level, where even the slightest interruption can incur huge losses or cause a major blackout, or even end the disaster. As the Stuxnet and black energy attacks have shown, one infected USB drive or single spear phishing email is all it takes for attackers to bridge the air gap and penetrate an isolated network. Traditional security is no longer enough to protect the industrial environment from cyber threats. So modern attack vectors go in around them, so it's using USB, malicious files, social engineering, remote access for contractors, and many other means. So malware always finds the way in through these physical fences, through firewalls, to devices and computers inside our industrial control system. So high fence is not the effective cyber defense anymore. Still, most of the cybersecurity offers reveal either missing or outdated antivirus among the top issues in the industrial network. So to be able to resist the actual cyber threat, Every critical infrastructure needs to have the cybersecurity controls inside the perimeter, right on the vulnerable devices and computers being hurt or attacked. We used to ignore it, but we cannot afford it anymore. Kaspersky Industrial Cybersecurity is specifically designed to protect complex industrial environments that contain a diverse range of proprietary systems. It's a highly flexible security solution that can be tailored to each installation's unique needs. So the interesting thing about that presentation to me is uh, that they measure they, they mentioned Stuxnet. Um, it, Stuxnet is probably the most cliched of all of the cybersecurity incidents that's the incidents that's happened. But it happened in the spring of 2010, and basically what happened was um, so this is in Iran at the uh, nuclear reactors. Um, uh, there at that time there were about 20,000 um, centrifuges in the in the nuclear industry in Iran. And um, each of those centrifuges, of course, connected to a control system. And um, each of those those small control systems is connected through a SCADA system where, where you as the, the operator of the nuclear plant have access to information from all of your um, from all of your, your centrifuges. So imagine if you're the operator in Iran managing their, their nuclear plant and you're looking at your HMIs, your human machine interfaces, and you have little pictures of all your centrifuges and you can tell um, how fast they're spinning because that's one of the important monitor points. Imagine that all of your screens show you your centrifuges are spinning at exactly the right rate. But uh, what had happened was someone had snuck in a USB drive and connected to one of the computers, just one of the computers, inside the power plant uh, or the, the research plant where they, where they had these centrifuges. Um, the Stuxnet worm was able to get to all of the centrifuges, and what it did was, uh, over a long period of time, like a, a few months, it would make the centrifuges spin really, really fast for a little while, but then it would slow them down so that uh, it, the, it wouldn't show up on the HMIs. If you were the operator looking at the, the displays, you would see nothing wrong, um, but the centrifuges were, were spinning really, really fast. 
Now what happens when you spin centrifuges way too fast for a period of a few months is that they basically burn themselves out, they destroy themselves. So what ended up happening was uh, at least three months after this Stuxnet virus was planted at the um, Iranian nuclear facility, all 20,000 of the centrifuges failed all at the same time. Um, it was the most disastrous setback for Iran's nuclear program uh, ever. And at this at this stage, it's it's kind of uh, I'm not sure if this is hypothesized or known, um, but it's said that that Israel was the the threat actor that went and did that that delivered this Stuxnet worm. But the the, the moral of the story here is that just with a little bit of information, you can you can spoof the operator control screens in critical industries. And by tricking the operator, you can do this for, for over a long time. You can actually end up destroying their equipment because you can you can misdirect them. You can direct their attention to something else or convince them that everything is okay when in fact isn't. So let me show you this other video, which is a little bit different, but gives you uh, a sense of the other side of cybersecurity risk. So it looks like we have an ad. So hold on just a second here. actually people out there and, and you know this is this is what they do for a job. Um, you know sometimes they're white hat hackers which means they do it in order to, to unveil um, security issues in, in systems. But you know the systems consist of both technologies and people and you know oftentimes it's the, the people who are uh, the greater threats. Um, in addition to these uh, industrial control system threats and the threats that come from social engineering, uh, you know, in the news you hear about things like like single source breaches, like you know Yahoo was broken into and lots of personal information was uh, was um, uh, unveiled and, and released. But there, there's other things that are seemingly harmless that are actually not harmless at all. Um, one of the things that, and this just happened the other day. I have a a friend on Facebook and uh, she goes by her middle name. So I, I've I've never known her first name, but she was in the hospital. She broke her arm. And she posted a picture from the hospital to tell everybody she broke her arm. And she took a picture of her arm with the, the 
hospital band around her wrist. Um, on that hospital band, it showed her first name, which I had never known. It showed her date of birth, month, day, and year. And it also showed her doctor's name. And, you know, now this is available on Facebook to her friends and to friends of friends. And so I, I told her, you know, hey, that's not really a good thing to post that up there, uh, you know, because there's there's pieces of information there that, that people like um, Jess in the video from uh, that I just showed you there uh, can use that information to do things like call your doctor and, you know, find out your insurance information and uh, all sorts of different things that, you know, maybe, maybe one breach is not so problematic, but if you amalgamate lots of breaches, um, that can be devastating and, we, you know, end up in identity theft. The last thing that I wanted to mention here is something that I tell all of my students, and, and many of you may have done this as well. You know those Facebook quizzes that um, they're like, what kind of pet do you like? Or what kind of pet is perfect for you? And then they ask you all sorts of seemingly harmless questions so that they can recommend to you what they think your, uh, your, your most recommended pet is. Um, those are not not entirely harmless. Um, next time you see a Facebook quiz, if, if you dare to take it, um, listen to the kinds of questions that they're asking. They ask very pointed questions that are usually related to security questions. So, uh, you know, one of the common security questions is, what's the name of your first pet? And it may be something that you've given to a Facebook quiz uh, that some uh, group of hackers who's aggregating information um, can pull together information from there as well. So if my if I leave any public service announcement here, uh, let it be. Be careful about posting information that you think is seemingly harmless, and also be careful of Facebook quizzes because uh, I know for a fact that a lot of them are not um, not uh, innocuous. Yeah, that's a good word. So cybersecurity risk. When personal information is lost, that's bad. Um, when groups of organized uh, hackers get your information and aggregate it from multiple sources, um, that's even more worse and it's just as easy to do. It just takes some time. But like you saw with the, the video that mentioned Stuxnet, uh, information can now easily be used to modify operators' views of what's going on at their plant, to damage equipment, or to even destroy equipment. Um, so that equipment can be physical assets, um, it can be critical infrastructure, and I'll show you in a second what I mean by critical infrastructure, or it can bring down entire supply chains um, pretty easily, and that's kind of frightening. So uh, a, a lot of where the threat lies here, the technical threat, is in industrial control systems. And industrial control systems are, industrial control systems are all of the people and hardware and equipment and software um, that control production processes. And uh, like I mentioned much earlier, consists of OT and IT. Um, IT is the stuff that you usually think of when you think of information technology. Um, OT is the operations technology. Uh, so these are the things that control, you know, the routing of your parts down your assembly line or the sorting of your pancakes as they're coming off the, the uh, cooker. Um, IT is usually, you know, usually when people think of cybersecurity, they think of IT cybersecurity, but the OT cybersecurity uh, is just as as important. And one of the reasons OT cybersecurity is really important uh, is that when when you walk into a plant, the technology is not always new. Um, you're going to run into um, you're going to run into equipment and machinery and software that's you know 10 or 20 or sometimes 30 years old, and 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, most of the, the industrial systems up at plants, at production facilities, were pretty well air-gapped, meaning none of the, the devices could talk to each other, none of the devices could talk to the outside world. Um, if they could talk, they were using uh, very, very old protocols for communication, uh, which were kind of hard to use. Um, but now, uh, lots of those devices that you can install to be components in your assembly lines and production facilities, lots of those components can immediately talk through internet protocol, um, which can be convenient, but it also adds a security risk. So in any case, in our industrial control systems um, that are in our plant, um, those industrial control systems usually rely on critical infrastructure. Um, critical infrastructure sectors are things that affect the entire country, and they're usually defined by presidential administrations. So, 
Um, Obama defined, he, he defined his critical infrastructure sectors twice. Um, the most recent time was in February 2013. Um, we've had word that this new administration is going to define their critical infrastructures soon. We don't know what soon means. Uh, and and here's, here's how the uh, sectors are usually defined. Critical manufacturing is, is one of them. Um, healthcare is obviously one of them. Um, water and wastewater treatment, because I mean, think about all of the companies that wouldn't be able to do business if there weren't reliable um, water and wastewater uh, facilities. Transportation systems, you know, this is how you get your products and how you get your uh, components from one place to another. Uh, if, if your inputs aren't reaching you, you're not gonna be able to create your products. And if the transportation systems aren't working, you're not gonna be able to, to get those to your customers to get those downstream. The only change that could possibly go on uh, is that thanks to the events of 2016, voting machines and the certification process are being considered to possibly be added to this critical infrastructure list, which would mean um, more regulation, but that might be a good thing. Uh, in fact, there was a, uh, I'm not sure what the legal term is, but um, that Kaspersky company from the first video that I showed you, uh, they're under, they're under uh, scrutiny right now um, because apparently there's some evidence that they interfered with the voting certification for um, at least three states' voting machines. Uh, like you've heard in the news, this doesn't mean that uh, your vote didn't get in, um, but what it does mean is that the vote certification process um, may have some issues. It also means that there may be additional votes that were uh, in those voting machines um, that were basically uh, just, you know, made up. So uh, uh, Kaspersky, they do great things for industrial control systems, but, you know, it, it's an interesting news development that they're also at the center of this um, voting, machine, voting machine controversy um, that uh, I'm, I'm still following. So, the industrial control systems that, that we use, that we employ in our plants, sit on top of critical infrastructure sectors. So we need those critical infrastructure elements in order to do our business. And a lot of times the, the critical infrastructure systems themselves have industrial control systems. Um, so like it says here, many of the critical infrastructure sectors employ industrial control systems. And um, there's many components inside those industrial control systems, which right now, as of the past few years, are cyber physical systems that can be breached. Um, another thing that we have to think about is for some of the critical infrastructure sectors, they aren't just in one location. You know, if you think of power distribution, power is produced at one site, um, but then the, the power lines that go from the production site, uh, you know, those also need to be uh, maintained. Um, they're also very vulnerable because, you know, it, it, you don't have to hack computers to go out to, um, uh, to where electrical power is, is being carried down wires on, on, a remote, on a remote rural highway and, you know, physically destroy that, thus damaging um, the power plant's ability to transmit the power from the, the generation site to the customers. Um, so, you know, there's, when you think of these critical infrastructure sectors that support businesses, production businesses, you have to think that it's not just the function that's at the center. It's not just, for example, the power production. You also have to think about transmission and distribution. You have to think about the multiple endpoints there, and there could be potential threats at all of those endpoints. So the thing to, thing to be aware of here is that industrial control systems both implement the, the critical infrastructure and requires the critical infrastructure to run. So it's a very, very symbiotic relationship. Um, and what it also means is that, you know, if you have a breach in any of those systems, that uh, it could affect a lot more people than just you. This is a typical view of an industrial control system architecture. This comes from the Department of Homeland Security. And um, down the bottom right, that's the uh, field controllers and field devices. Those are the things that you usually find um, in your in your plants. Um, but what you'll notice is that the, the control system network, it's, it's all together and usually, usually everything within your, your production system, your, your plant um, IT and OT, um, is usually connected to the world 
through a firewall. So what a firewall does is you route your traffic, you route all of your network traffic inside and outside of your, your production facility, you route it through that one firewall, and you can, you can basically, you have the option to inspect every single packet that goes through that firewall. So your ability to inspect is, you know, a potentially a very, very good thing. Um, unfortunately, as we add new internet connected field devices and field controllers, uh, what we're doing is we have to, we have to control their communication ability so that, uh, you know, now we have to make sure we consciously route their communications through the rest of our control system network and through our firewalls. So uh, it's just that we're opening up more channels for communication, which can be good. It can, you know, we can, we can give our employees and our customers remote access to things and that can make life a lot easier, uh, but it also increases the risk to us. Um, this is just another view of um, what uh, industrial control systems architectures look like. Everything to the left, everything to the left of that uh, 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 coordination system, this is the SCADA system, those are the things inside your plant, that's the OT, the operations technology, uh, and then the, the IT is over on the right hand side. Uh, IT includes things like human machine interfaces, those are the, the controls that your operators use to both monitor and control your production process. So just wanted to give you a sense of, of what the different names are and how they're related to each other. And that you, you have potential cybersecurity threats uh, in all of these places. You know, at each switch, you have a potential cybersecurity uh, threat. At each sensor, you know, the sensors can be um, controlled to give you information that doesn't reflect what's actually going on on your plant floor or at your refinery or, you know, whatever, whatever industrial process you're, you're managing. So lots and lots of different endpoints. We have to consider what all of them are. So ICS, industrial control systems, can fail. And there's lots of different ways they can fail. Uh, they can fail through poor system design. They can fail because you have tired operators who are looking at their software screens who just aren't noticing that there's an anomaly that, that could mean a catastrophic failure in another hour. You can have hardware and software failures. Um, or, you know, acts of war or natural disasters like tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, um, those can cause failures in industrial control systems as well. Now, failures, as you see, they can be due, due to technical error or human error. When you're managing cybersecurity, you have to make sure that you don't just address those technical components, those potential technical risks that come from errors that could arise, but also the potential um, problems that can arise when, when human error uh, happens. There's lots and lots of industrial accidents you can read about where the operators had been working for you know, 12, 16, 18, 20 hours uh, where they didn't change shifts and they didn't notice that, that one, of the, one of the valves was not working, and so the uh, tanks were allowed to fill with um, very dangerous chemicals, and then the tanks um, overflowed. So you have, there, there's lots of, uh, lots of industrial accidents that you can uh, look up to see things like that happen. Bottom line, technical error and human error, you have to look at both of those components. Um, so in your industrial control system, when, when you're dealing with things like the field controllers and the field devices, failures in those field controllers and field devices have physical consequences, just like in the Stuxnet example, where the physical consequences were information sent through the system was allowed to speed up those centrifuges for a period of months without any human operator noticing that burned all those centrifuges out at the same time. Huge, huge loss of investment. Um, security problems with OT often look like maintenance failures or other small process issues. So they're kind of hard, it's kind of hard to detect that they're going on. Um, also, you're usually dealing with older systems for which security was just not a consideration when those systems were being developed. Um, and also, uh, OT security can be impacted by other things um, like, uh, the fact that there can be, you know, 20 or 30 different communications protocols um, that all of your field devices and field controllers can communicate with each other about. So uh, lots of different considerations. So now we get to the really interesting part, and that is threat agents. So in your um, 
in your industrial control system, when you have your plant, your production facility, your warehouse, you can have threats come from three different places. Mainstream hackers who basically just want to get attention, uh, organized groups who are not affiliated with nation states but want to make a point. Those would be things like, uh, uh, we, we haven't seen this in a while, but like an environmental activists or you know, people who want to, to take down the bad guys. But then you also have very organized groups who are associated with countries, uh, terrorists or nation states who are trying to bring down elements of the critical infrastructure, and uh, they are also threats. Um, the threats can be either to your information technology or to your operations technology, and it can be it can be from many different sources. So uh, what you'll see here in the threat agent slide is we have several different options here. There are professional bot herders. Um, so if you've been reading the news following uh, the fact that there's there's armies of of bots which are either people or you know programmed Twitter accounts. Um, this, I've been watching these for the past two years, they've been out there for two years, um, organized groups of Twitter accounts whose job is to basically deny service to accounts that they don't want the information to come out of those particular accounts. And you can have organized crime who are threat actors. Um, they, it, there's a lot of uh, ransomware threats going on right now. Uh, that uh, rumor has it are, are being organized by mafias from different countries. And basically what those ransomware threats do is they freeze your computer and then force you to go pay Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency, to make sure to, to let your files be accessible to you um, at all. Um, intelligence services also do this. There's industrial espionage, which means um, you know, breaking into your competitors' computers to see if you can figure out what their trade secrets are. Uh, lots and lots of, of different types of threat agents here. And the interesting thing is, is that people who work for you can also be threat agents. Um, contractors that you have, um, people who you've had to let go, who may have a vendetta against you or the company. And the thing to remember is that even though one of these insiders um, these people who have insider access to your systems may not have a strong motivation to do it. They have lots of opportunity because they're on premises and they have passwords and they have the, the uh, training to use all of your, your systems. And that capability uh, makes them strong threats. So you have to think about those human actors as well. Um, insiders and outsiders. Insiders are those people who are your employees or former employees. They have the knowledge and the training information to be able to attack any of these endpoints in your systems, any of your field devices or field controllers or um, firewalls that connect you to the outer world. Uh, and those impacts can be either direct or indirect. Um, one of the examples of an indirect threat uh, is that, you know, if you're monitoring part of your control system, if you're, if you're supposed to monitor that, that device every 10 minutes, you know, maybe you're monitoring the temperature of a tank where you're uh, mixing some chemical or, or, or controlling some process. Um, if, if instead you change that sampling frequency from once every 10 minutes to once every 0.1 seconds, um, you can, you can uh, uh, you know, so a lot of those devices are not built, you know, they're, they're 20 or 30 years old, they're not built to handle those high sampling frequencies. And so you can actually wear down the equipment by sampling a lot faster than they were meant to, fit, to, to be sampled at. And so that's an example of a, an indirect threat. A direct threat would be like what happened in Stuxnet. Um, the operator's control screens where they were able to see how fast the centrifuges were spinning were spoofed. So the, the uh, screens that they were looking at looked like all the centrifuges were working just fine. So threats from inside and threats from outside. And there's, there's lots of different names that are attached to these different attack types. Um, one that you've probably heard a lot in the news lately is the zero-day attack. Basically, these are vulnerabilities that go out when an operating system or some other device, um, uh, excuse me, some other uh, utility is just released from its vendor. Uh, and those vulnerabilities, um, uh, you know, if you catch those zero-day vulnerabilities, then you can get uh, unauthorized access to systems. Uh, there's a, you can follow on Twitter, ICS.CERT. Um, that's a, a 
division of, of the Department of Homeland Security, and their job is to make sure that they track and report and catalog all of those possible zero-day vulnerabilities. And it's kind of scary uh, because, you know, in the systems that, you know, if, even if you're not a production facility, just in the business systems that you use, uh, these, these bulletins from ICS CERT come out two, three times a day. So there's, you know, hackers are on it and they're, they're going to be waiting for these new vulnerabilities and to, to capitalize on them. Uh, and it's, it's not infrequent. It's, it, you know, I see them come through two or three times a day. So there's this vision of the world. You know, if you've heard of Internet of Things with your connected coffee machines and your connected trash cans, there's this vision of the world that any of these household items uh, can be hacked and can refuse to operate unless you, you know, pay them or do something from a, uh, someone who's holding your toaster ransom. And it, even though it seems silly, it's not far from being able to happen now. I think the only thing that's preventing, uh, you know, a, a dystopian uh, view of the world like this is that, you know, how many of you guys have a connected refrigerator or a connected coffee machine? Um, probably not many of you. So what I would advise is, you know, be careful when we bring these things into your home because these problems here with, with your, you, with your um, appliances uh, being subject to ransomware attacks, these problems haven't been solved. And, uh, you know, any, any, any company that's telling you they've completely solved these problems is, is not being totally straight up with you. So just, uh, you know, caveat emptor. Um, all of these threats, whether they're from uh, individual hackers uh, or whether they're from organized nation states or terrorist groups, the consequences vary. You know, some of the consequences, not so much. You know, if you have denial of service to your, your Twitter account for uh, an hour, that's definitely not as bad as uh, if there's a supply chain that's disrupted. Um, but the likelihood of small bad things happening is high. The big bad things happening, it, it takes time to aggregate all the information that you need. Or, you know, if you were the one breaking into Iran's nuclear program, it took time to figure out how to get that USB stick into their industrial control system uh, and to all of their 20,000 uh, centrifuges so that they could all be failed at the same time. However, there is a chance these low likelihood attacks that are high severity, uh, the most severe ones are on critical infrastructure sectors and they can lead to pretty intense supply chain disruption. Um, of course, cyber attacks are not the only way that your critical infrastructure can disrupt, disrupt your supply chain. This can also happen when you have acts of war or when you have natural disasters like earthquakes or hurricanes or even floods. Um, or, uh, you know, if, if you have labor issues because, uh, you know, humans that are insiders are threats, particularly when they're disgruntled, and that can be a problem too. Um, so your, your supply chain risks can happen on the short term. They can disrupt your immediate production or, you know, cause uh, uh, lots of your supplies building up and, and you can't process them and, and produce the product that uh, you want to process. Um, or there can be long-term effects like, you know, if, if certain supply chains are um, broken because, you know, transportation systems aren't, you know, the, the control systems underlying the transportation systems aren't working, um, you can have effects that are, that are further delayed. So can't do that much uh, where cybersecurity is concerned for natural disasters, um, but for the people, uh, for, for labor unrest and for terrorist attacks, we definitely can. And so the last couple of minutes are going to be uh, focusing on how do we protect against these threats. So this is in addition to your IT people who are hopefully, uh, you know, doing uh, good cyber hygiene, like uh, making sure you have firewalls installed, making sure they're looking at log files to see if there's any strained IP addresses breaking into your system. But you also want to take a look at cybersecurity in a holistic way from the organization level. Unfortunately, now there's two ways to do it. You can take a look at cybersecurity from your business process side, and you do that using the um, new Baldridge Cybersecurity Excellence Builder. Or you can do it from the systems engineering side using the also very new NIST cybersecurity framework. The most recent one only came out in January. Um, both of these, both of these cybersecurity management tools 
Um, they're advertised as being purely for self-assessment and gap analysis, um, but this is a good thing because that can help us uh, identify and prioritize opportunities for improvement. So there's five areas of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, I say that these are more on the systems engineering side because they, they relate to how do you identify all of those endpoints in your control system, whether they're on the plant floor or whether they're in the business offices. And that's the, the column on the left there. How do you identify where the risks are? Second column is now that you know where all the risks are and where the endpoints are, you know, what can you, what can you conceptually um, tangibly do to make sure that those devices are hardened from individual attacks um, or attacks from the outside. Um, detection of anomalies is a big one. Uh, and in order to detect whether there's anomaly, you need to know what the base state of your system is. You need to know what it looks like when it's working um, as you expect it to. And then you have the respond and recover areas. So uh, once you have anomalies that are detected, um, you know, what are you going to do? What's your process in place for handling those? Um, the unique part of the NIST cybersecurity framework is that for each one of those blocks in the previous slide, um, it, it, it breaks the blocks down and it tells you what to do and how to do it. So, for example, this is an example from the, the asset management block. This is in the identify section, way, way, way over the, on the left, the yellow part of the last slide. And what this says is, uh, the, one of the things that you have to do, one of the what that you have to do is inventory all of your physical devices and systems. Find all your endpoints, catalog them. What the column on the right shows is, hey, you know, there's a whole bunch of standards that can help you do, you know, specifically do exactly that. So what the NIST cybersecurity framework provides you with is some instructions as to the tasks that you need to do when you're implementing your cybersecurity management and then some of the standards and guidance that you can look at that will tell you how to do it. So what are those best practices? And that's why, um, that's why the NIST cybersecurity framework is really good from the systems engineering perspective. If you hone in on just the middle part of the NIST cybersecurity framework, um, it, there's the detect component. And one of the interesting things that I think about the detect component is, is that if you're gonna detect those anomalies, you need to know what your processes and your expected behavior are now. And quality systems are, are one way to do that, to document the processes and to know what's supposed to be happening. The second thing is, is, you know, we know from quality control that we need to be able to tell when to tamper with the system, you know, when to go in and fix something or when to leave it alone. You know, when, when this, this anomaly is just due to random fluctuations. And so, you know, that sort of philosophy is also very, very important in anomaly detection. Well, not just the detection part, but, you know, knowing what you should do when you detect that anomaly. And ideally, you know, we don't want to have to inspect all of those packets coming in and out of our devices or in and out of our organizations, but that's the approach that a lot of companies use right now. They just try to monitor all the transactions. And we know from history that monitoring all the transactions, inspecting everything sometimes has value but there are ways to get around 100% inspection. Um, this is the area where, you know, cybersecurity is not there yet. So uh, they are where quality was maybe, I don't know, 80, 90 years ago, 50 years ago, 60, something like that. Um, so we'll probably see a progression of, we'll probably see a progression of, uh, you know, how to manage things in cybersecurity uh, that's, that's analogous to what happened in quality. Um, since the Deming days. Um, the Baldur's Cybersecurity Excellence Builder is actually, a, if you're familiar with the Baldur's criteria, it, it works very, very much the same. Um, so they have their Baldur's Burger, which is exactly the same as the one for the complete organizational assessment. And the idea is, is that you go into each of those areas and the criteria provide you with questions and answers that you, you need to answer to figure out how to characterize what your process is and how your cybersecurity considerations relate to your business results. So uh, what you do if you're following the broader cyber, cybersecurity excellence framework is you go in, you get teams to answer these questions, figure out what you're doing, make sure everybody is literally on the same page, and then use it as a, a, a guidepost to see how you can increase the maturity of your systems in all of these six areas, leadership through operations focus, 
And then the unique part here, and this is why I say that for the Baldred Cybersecurity Excellence Builder takes things from a business perspective, you are tying everything you do in cybersecurity to business results. And so that is its strength. So here's what I'm gonna leave you with. And this is what I think the, the secret sauce is of this presentation. And we talked about the definition of quality, the totality of characteristics of an entity that bear upon its ability to satisfy stated and implied needs. What that implies now, since there are so many cyber physical systems, not just in your company or at your plant, but also in the critical infrastructure that supplies you with the utilities you need to make your business go. That it, we can't get away from it anymore. We, we, cannot, we cannot ensure quality in our products or in our production processes without looking at cybersecurity, simply because there's so many cyber physical systems embedded in the system that helps us produce our stuff and deliver it to our customers. So there's a lot of things that you know how to do now, skills that you have right now, that you could immediately transfer to use in the context of cybersecurity to help those IT guys and to help those systems people uh, harden their processes. And there's things like documenting and benchmarking processes, knowing how to figure out if something is really an anomaly or not. And beyond that, figuring out when to take corrective action. And then there's still that, that huge unsolved problem of how do we do this without having to expect, inspect all of the packets that are going into and out of an organization. Um, we can learn how to design cybersecurity in, you know, using design for Six Sigma type uh, 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 methodologies that, that all of us are already familiar with. And of course, risk identification, risk management, being able to carry that all the way up to the supply chain. There are so many companies right now that are addressing cybersecurity well, but they don't take it to the human and social engineering side very well, and they don't extend it up to the impact on supply chain risk very well. Matter of fact, this week, I'm uh, doing the, the equivalent of a board review for an organization that, that arguably has um, the, some of the world's best cybersecurity experts today. And we went and we looked at their cybersecurity plan, which is excellent, but they missed those two parts. They missed the role of the human, the role of the insider threats and in making sure that your cybersecurity plan is, is uh, uh, solid. And they miss to the, you know, what are the supply chain impacts if any of these elements of our cybersecurity program are breached? So the good thing is here, there's lots of opportunity. And so many of you on this call have the skills that are immediately transferable. So what I hope I've done is opened up your eyes to how you can contribute to cybersecurity, not just in your organization, but in other organizations over the next, you know, five to 15 years. That's what I'd like to leave you with. Nicole, thank you very much for this amazing presentation. I appreciate all of us have some uh, great takeaways um, to assess any potential cybersecurity threat or risk in our own processes. So to let the attendees know that this video is gonna be uh, uploaded into our ASQ Innovation YouTube channel. Uh, you can just search ASQ Innovation and you will see the videos there. Um, let me see, um, I know we are running out of time, so we may not be able to um, do a Q&A, um, but, um, well, I really appreciate I'm your participation. I'm very friendly, and you can email me anytime. <laughs> yeah, the, your email is at the beginning of the presentation, so thank you for the offer. Um, well, Nicole, again, uh, thank you very much for uh, delivering such an amazing presentation today. And until next time, thank you very much, everybody who attended the call. Thanks, everybody.